Okay, so as we can see, I'm not alone today. I'm here with Roberto Zamora, who is a lawyer from Costa Rica, who's taken a couple of very interesting cases um, before the uh, Costa Rican courts that we're going to talk about today. I will get back to the NGO series as soon as I'm able to. I was going to, I got laryngitis and couldn't talk for an entire month. So that's why that's gotten a bit shelved. But when I heard Roberto was coming to Dublin, I thought we have to meet up and we have to talk about these cases, which are very, very uh, interesting as far as international law is concerned. So Roberto, thanks first of all for coming here today. What, could you tell us a little bit about these judgments, these cases that you pursued? Yeah, what well, were they about? Uh, Why were they important? Yeah, well, first of all, the, thank you for the time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree with you that uh, the, the issues the cases deal with are of a common interest. And uh, it's, it's yeah, important to, to talk about them as, as they bring us closer to something we need a lot, which is uh, peace. Uh, and that what the cases are about. Uh, it's it's basically two cases. Okay. Uh, the first one is related to the position of the government of Costa Rica towards the war against Iraq mm -hmm. or the invasion of Iraq. And the second case is regarding the a decree issued by the uh, Oscar Arias. Uh, allowing the manufacture of nuclear uh, reactors and nuclear okay. fuel in Costa Rica for all purposes. Okay. Uh, for all purposes. Being the problem of okay. the decree, the phrase "all purposes." All right. Um, the the first case uh, took place during the context of the beginning of the invasion of Iraq by the uh, British American coalition of the willing. And was Costa Rica part of that coalition? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. On March 19, uh, 2003, uh, Costa Rica time, uh, just as the bombing began, uh, the, the president of Costa Rica, for reasons that only he knows, uh, decided to issue uh, support okay. to Costa Rican government right. to the coalition of the willing. Um, but I'm kind of interested here. Costa Rica does not have an army, as far as I know. So when he was issuing support, this was just a declaration of support. Like, there wasn't anything necessarily material attached to that support. Not really. Uh, you, you, you have to remember that yeah. since the invasion of Iraq was never authorized by the United Nations, yeah. the U.S. made a big, big lobby mm -hmm. to justify its yeah. war. And... I mean, during the time Bush changed his argumentation many times, yes. but the first first story was that this that was a war for peace, democracy, and human rights. Yeah. And he was trying to get support from nations, and yeah, you gotta think if 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 you are to address the issues of peace, democracy, and human mm -hmm. rights, and you gotta find one country with authority to talk on those issues. Yeah. I will think about Costa Rica. Okay. I mean Costa Rica is, is one of the best standards on peace, democracy and human rights. Okay. And in that respect, whatever political support mm -hmm. or the image of Costa Rica as a member of this coalition would mean quite a bit. Okay. And, and that's where the support was strategically important okay. uh, to the United States. In fact, we don't have an army. Uh, if we had one, there's no way we can contribute to the... <laughs> Too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, we cannot finance the war because we don't have money. Uh, but on the political side, at the international level, having Costa Rica on their side mm -hmm. was a big thing. But you said Costa Rica shouldn't be on their side. Oh, hell no. There's reasons. Okay, why? Why did, why? I mean, you didn't just say it shouldn't be. You took it to court and you won the court case. How did you win that court case? How, on what, what were the laws involved? Yeah, well, just before getting there, uh, why I went to the court? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it has a lot to do with the, the, our identity as Costa Ricans. Mm -hmm. uh, Polls were run okay. uh, right after the support, okay. and the 
we got a staggering ninety nine point two percent of rejection of really? the decision of the government. Even though it was just you know a, a supportive statement, there weren't any soldiers going or anything. It's unacceptable okay. for a Costa Rican right. such an action. Okay. Uh, it it's it's totally out of our reality. Okay. Uh, I mean, and we were not expecting that. Mm-hmm. Like we were expecting just to remain at the side yeah. of the conflict as we usually do. Okay. We remain as a neutral country. Okay. Uh, and and this decision shook the country. Uh, when it came the time to decide whether or not to file a suit, uh, well, that had a lot to do with temporary issues okay. <laughs> and uh, and then that it I, I just couldn't accept the situation and yeah. uh, and what did, what did you win though what was like we know I mean we're, we're in Ireland here we're filming in Ireland right now Ireland claims to be a neutral country as well um, but it doesn't it, there's nothing in the Constitution that says Ireland is a neutral country right so there's no internal obligation as you want for Ireland to be neutral. We've never said in our constitution, and by the way, we're neutral. It's just a policy that they have. And Ireland, as you know, has, has I'm sure, as you're aware, has actually sort of uh, tacitly supported the Iraq war because we've allowed a lot of uh, US airplanes to fly through here, carrying soldiers and uh, ammunition and, and arms on their way to be used in the Iraq war. And Ireland's kind of tried to walk this in my view, somewhat non-existent tightrope of neutral but not really neutral. And we had a case here where um, someone, Horgan, his name was Mr. Horgan, took this case to uh, the Irish courts and he lost that case. So how come he lost and you won? You, you have to, to, to take into account that uh, neutrality is not in the written constitution of Costa Rica. Okay. Um, uh, we have a mixed constitutional system. Okay. Uh, where we have a written constitution, but there is a non-written constitution also. Okay. Uh, which is, I think, the only country in the world that uh, have both systems. And so neutrality was uh, proclaimed by President Monge in 1983. Okay. Uh, there was the U.S.-Nicaragua conflict going on, so the CIA was pushing the Costa Rican government to allow the Contras to train in the northern plains of Costa Rica, which is south of the border with Nicaragua. And, uh, well, being a small country uh, under the influence of the United States uh, mm-hmm. is, is, is not easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, President Monge found an elegant, and, uh, I mean, as a solution that was up to Costa Rica's history, mm-hmm. and he decided to declare Costa Rica neutral. Okay. So when the CIA came again, he said, oh, yeah, guys, I'm sorry, we're neutral now. Okay. So I cannot help you anymore because then I would be violating international law. And they accepted and that. They had to. Okay. They had to. So um, n- neutrality is. So do you think neutrality can actually be an advantage for a small country? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, small armies. Right. Are useless. That's I, I was I think much the same myself. It's useless for the sole reason that if the purpose of an army is to protect the country, there is no way on earth that a Costa Rican army or a Salvadoran army or a, you know, Irish army can stand against an American invasion. Yeah. So if it doesn't make sense, why don't you rather use the monies in other important issues such as education as welfare? which is what happened in Costa Rica when the army was abolished in 1948. The, 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 the constitutional decree that abolished the army uh, diverted the monies into education and healthcare, and that's why Costa Rica is uh, the only Central American country with human development indexes that's like European standards. That, I have to admit, it's a very sensible-sounding plan. Do you, th- do you see chances for other countries maybe looking at Costa Rica and adopting a similar approach? Or do you see the world getting more militarized? Because even like Germany and Japan, you, they were quite demilitarized after the Second World War. And now they're kind of coming back and uh, looking to involve themselves more. 
in militarized actions throughout mm -hmm. the world, you know, like the EU Rapid Reaction Force and things like that. So um, do you see the trend going more military or less military or anything in between? And how could you go about perhaps um, working towards a, a less militarized world? I mean, the world is like, I think a lot of people don't appreciate it. The world is like awash with weapons. You know, I think the states produce like eight million small arms a year or something like that. I mean, weapons everywhere, and you can get them fairly cheap. Even in the Charlie Hebdo case, I mean, the two guys who did that bought rocket launchers and automatic rifles for 5,000 euros. It's not very expensive. So it kind of just gives people an idea of the scale of, of what's out there. How do you think we can combat that in any way? Like, do you see this as a model for beginning to combat that, for countries not spending such an enormous amount of their budget on these weapons? It's often a lot. And you're so right, it does seem to make more sense to spend that on social programs. I mean, if, if, if you ask me what should small countries do, I mean, to me it's just a matter of common sense and caring for their citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, I don't see any reason to obligate peasants to get into military. Mm -hmm. uh, let them grow their crops, feed other people, uh, you know, make a living, support their families. Uh, but uh, common sense is the least common <laughs> of all senses, right? Uh, and so that, that's, that's one thing. And, and then the other thing is that if you look at those countries that are more involved in waging war are precisely the countries that produce more weapons. The US, the UK, France, uh, is the main, uh, Israel, which is in constant siege, uh, illegal yeah. siege of Gaza. Uh -huh. um, and these countries are the ones who are not interested in uh, abolishing war. Uh -huh. uh, you can make the connections and the links that you want but the truth is that, I mean, here's the funny thing. The permanent members of the Security Council know nothing about peace. Mm -hmm. They know a lot about war, mm -hmm. but they don't know about peace. Mm -hmm. And if it's the main organ of the United Nations when it comes to preserving peace, mm -hmm. why do we have the guys that are waging war there? Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's it's. Do you think there's a right to peace? Do you think this is uh, something? Because I know you're kind of pursuing that now. But do you think not that only this I is... think that there is a right to peace. Mm -hmm. uh, we we made it become a reality in Costa Rica mm -hmm. uh, through the the courts, mm -hmm. and, uh, institutionalized mm -hmm. in constitutional fashion, mm -hmm. through the work of uh, a citizen. Mm -hmm acting on his mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. uh, and using above all uh, Costa Rican history mm -hmm. to demonstrate that, it, that there, there is in, in fact in Costa Rica a right to peace that had been created by this government and by the people through time mm -hmm. and that this intention to become a pacifist nation was uh, made public and evident through the Neutrality Proclamation. Um, okay, well, before we have to leave it there, um, but congratulations uh, on right. your case and all your hard work that you've put into it. Um, so this is International Law in Question, and we'll be back next week. At, this week, we're here with Roberto Zamero, but we'll be back next week uh, with the second installment of our series on NGOs. Thanks.